going to focus on some recent enhancements which expand on our master scheduling functionality. Um, resellable returns and back order cancels can now be assigned by warehouse. So the resell return functionality was moved to our warehouse default screen within the admin module. And this allows our users to set resellable returns and back order cancels by warehouse and merge hierarchy under a particular warehouse. An additional enhancement for multi-echelon users is transfer functionality was previously limited to transfers moving down the echelon tree. With this enhancement, transfers are now open to all locations. Clients can transfer across warehouses or even up the echelon back to their supplying warehouse. A second multi-echelon change allows users to assign multiple vendors um, by SKU and warehouse. So for those clients with, who may have warehouses located in different geographic locations, the same product can be sourced by different vendors um, at different price points. So this will accommodate that um, need. And for multi-warehouse users, we have added a new location totals tab in the miscellaneous section of materials planning. So we now have a single spot where you can go in and see inventory, demand and receipt information by week for across all locations. So let's take a look at these in more detail. So resellable returns and back order cancels were previously managed at the company level and on the item master default screen within master scheduling. So as I mentioned, we moved them to warehouse default screen in the admin module, and this allows users to be able to go in and set the resellable returns or back order cancels by warehouse or by location. Some examples of where this might be needed is if you do fulfillment by Amazon, clients may see different return rates between their Amazon customers versus their non-Amazon customers. So they can set that up now. And also stores may see different return rates based off of their geographic location um, and hierarchy if they're in the north or if they're in the south. So. For our ME customers, our transfer functionality has been opened up to all warehouses. So transfer order source assignment, it occurs within the warehouse default screen on our fill priority tab, and users can now set up transfers crossing the echelon hierarchy. So when you enter a supplier source location, there will be a drop down box that you see now that um, lets you select the warehouse and location transfer. So this gives us a lot more flexibility when we're managing inventory across our organization. Another ME enhancement is our ability <clears throat> to assign multiple vendors per warehouse and SKU. So as I mentioned before, some clients have warehouses located in different geographic locations, and for logistic reasons, the same product might be supplied by different vendors from the East Coast or the West Coast. So we can now assign a default vendor per warehouse per SKU, which is then used within the vendor order review or transfer order review screens when recommending um, requisitions and transfers. So this data must be interfaced into SoftVision Suite on the IMWH interface file. So if this is a feature you're interested in, make sure to discuss this with your CSC in more detail so we can walk through the changes that have to happen to accommodate that. And lastly, for our multi-warehouse customers, we have a new tab that was added to the miscellaneous section, um, and it provides a single screen where you can look at your beginning on hand, release and demand by week across all locations and by weekly period. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Janine, who's going to talk to us about action items and how to set them up within the room. Great. Thank you, Linda. Hi, everyone. As Jeff mentioned, uh, we did talk about the actionable functionality that had been added to the pivot and graph views that are available in DRS now. And we wanted to talk about not only re-emphasizing the fact that we do have pivot and graph functionality, but that the actual report function we really believe is being underutilized. You're running reports to do analysis or to gather information, and perhaps you need to take that extra step or need to view additional information to make a decision. So the beauty of making a report actionable is it allows the user to link directly into the product level forecasting screen, 
product or SKU level materials planning screen. And if you happen to be a suggested purchase order client, you also have the option to launch into the vendor order review screen. Our standard system views that exist, which are those reports that you'll see in the menu that are preceded with the VDRS, are already configured for action reporting. And with these particular reports, Reports, you can you have the option to go in and select a default screen that you'd like them to launch to you can do that in the custom reports as well it's pretty easy to configure to make custom reports that you're running actionable and and we'll walk you through that in the screens when Stuart's in there but all of this is based on really just trying to make you more efficient getting your getting to make your decisions and any kind of changes you need in a much faster fashion. Go to the next screen, please. Perfect. All right, so once you're in the report, to make a non-standard view report actionable, you're gonna click on the icon on the toolbar action, action columns. And what it's going to do is it's going to pop up a screen on the right-hand side. <clears throat> so these are the options of the screen that you're, are available to you. And the, each one of these different screens has a either required or optional field that needs to be linked. So in the example of the first one for product level forecasting, the required field you must have in here is product ID. If you're not familiar or uh, unsure as to what to exactly add in this column, there is a drop down arrow that allows you to select the field closest to what's required here. Once you've finished this aspect of the screen, you're gonna to wanna to hit the save icon so that a message will appear down at the bottom of the screen that lets you know that it's been saved successfully. Once you've done that, you just simply save and exit, and the next time that you retrieve your report, you now have the ability to launch into a screen. And if we can go into the next screen, we'll show here is in the pivot format. How to launch the screens is you simply click on one of the cells within the report. You'll right click and it'll pull up the menu of product level forecasting, SKU, or product materials planning. You select that and it'll open up that screen for you. Just as a reminder, the vendor order review is only available to those that have suggested purchase order. And you'll, it'll, Stuart will be able to do more justice with the live screen demo for this. And with that, I'm going to pass it along to him. Thanks, Janine. This is Stuart. I'm going to demonstrate these enhancements in a sample dashboard. This is the product level forecast screen. And here I'm on the edit tab. There's different tabs that show different functions within these ribbons. The default tab, when you open up PLF, is the edit tab. This is where you have your product, product search, setting off a criteria, and then these other screens that you could link to. So these are now, you know, demonstrated better and uh, are visible better here than they were in the other toolbar. If you go to the other tab, like view, you see things like customize, you customize your column layout, auto fit, and some other options that are here. Help will take you to the help icon. And then home has some other functions like save, save and exit, save and publish, and then send to Excel. Now also on top is this quick access toolbar. This will always remain regardless of the tab that you're in. And you can customize this. So if you find rather than clicking here each time, you know, maybe you export it to Excel, you could right click and add to quick access toolbar. So now that will remain. This is user specific and it will remember when you come in and out of PLF or any of the screens. So this is just the ribbon in PLF. We have the ribbons in the other modules. In maps, there'll be a separate tab for products. But on any of them, you could go in and customize this quick access uh, toolbar. And again, you could right click to remove it or add it.
And so when you're working through there, you'll have to, you'll see which ones you use. For PLF, most of the functions you're using is already on the set it tab. All right, any questions on the toolbar or the ribbon? Hey, Stuart. Yeah, we do have um, two questions that came. Um, the first one was, if transfers are no longer limited to their echelon hierarchy, can they be set up to stock balance locations? Uh, you can, but do you want me to go through that when I get to the transfer? Uh, sure. <laughs> or, or sure. Yeah, yeah, that it popped up with in Linda's section. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. We'll go through that when we go through the... Uh, the transfers and changing that. Okay. So right now, so this is the ribbon. I'm now going to go on to, was there another question, Megan, or no? Um, the, with location tab. Is okay. Okay, so we'll wait for that we'll till we get to that. Well. Yeah, yep. that's fine, just remember those. And let me go through the PLF price change. You're now able to make markdowns directly in PLF and do that quickly across one or more offers. So here I have one offer. If I hold down shift or control, I could select multiple offers, right click, and go to adjust unit price. So this will show me the offers that I selected and the number of SKUs I'll be affecting. So if I go in here and put in a markdown percent, let's say 0.20 and hit enter, and save, this will then mark these down 20%. So you could see here, we'll see the markdown percent. You'll also see the average and weighted price for the offer compared to the weighted list price. So these do have different prices because we do have different uh, retail prices. This is a Thermaline jacket for different sizes. So the tall sizes are at a higher price. But you could compare here your list price against the weighted price. And we quickly made that markdown. You could also see your revenue at list price compared to your forecast revenue. And gross margin. We're now at a gross margin of 29%. You could see gross margin dollars against list price dollars and the variance in the margin. So this is, this is handy to do to make these markdowns. You're also able to see the effect of those markdowns right away on that screen. And before this, you would have had to go into display SKUs and go in and manually change this. So you could see that I put in the markdown, it automatically figured the unit price by taking that markdown, even though some of these are at different unit prices. Hi, right, any questions on the PLF price change? All right, let me move on to the uh, master scheduling and multi echelon. We moved item master defaults from master scheduling to warehouse defaults. And warehouse defaults is in administration and the master scheduling section. And you could see this tab to the right is returns and back orders. So if I expand these levels, and these are the multi-echelon levels. Here we have warehouse and store. You may define or call these differently. This could be CDC, this could be warehouse, this could be Amazon, but however you define it, you're now able to set a cancel and return percent specific to that warehouse. So if you have different return rates, you could go in there and make that change. And if you do make a change, it'll highlight and show. And again, there up here is the option for overrides. You could override child values or prompt for action. So this works similar to the way it worked in item master default. It is set by a hierarchy. So you might have different return rates by category or subcategory. So here within this category, the subcategory BB, I have different return and cancel rates and a different curve. And this is set specific to this warehouse. So all of these products then will inherit this return and back order. And if I go into 
materials planning, and I'm on this product tab, you could also see this information. So here's the warehouse IDs. Here's a different return and cancel percent. You can view it or edit it here. So you can make those changes here as well. And this will show at a product level or at a SKU level if I click the SKU. Any questions on that? All right. This, let me, is, a lot, this is a lot for everyone to take in. We understand that. Just uh, um, a lot of you don't even have multi echelon, but uh, this is a good way for you to, to get exposure to it and understand some of the concepts of it. Um, so continue, Stuart, but please, if there's additional questions or if you're curious about anything, ask. Otherwise, follow up with us uh, with questions. Go ahead, Stuart. Right. right. And, and this was developed because uh, people did, did want to request different return and cancels by warehouse, which is why we moved it to warehouse defaults. So I'm going to go back to warehouse defaults and look at the transfers. So if I go to fill priority, you could see here that you have a primary supplier type and then the supplier. So prior to this release, you were only able to make transfers from a top level down to a bottom level. You cannot make transfers between levels, between the same level, or go up a level. Now you're able to do that. So if here in Denver, I could change this to store. So now my transfers could come from the store. And the store that you select will not come up here to avoid a circular reference, but I could say now that this is a supplier. I could go in here and make any of these changes here to either primary, secondary, or tertiary. Even here, I could say, I want this to be transferred from the store back into the warehouse. And you could do that and select that here in warehouse defaults. Um, even if you don't set it here, you could do it in materials planning. You can make a transfer from one location to any other location within materials planning. Any questions on that? Stuart would now be a good time for you to address that. Sure, sure. So um, I'll repeat it for you. Uh, the question is, if transfers are no longer limited to their echelon therapy, can they be set up to stock balance locations? You can. You could set it there or you could go in here. If you're going in and doing actions, you could set this to a transfer order and you could change the supplier here. Okay, so here I am in the warehouse and here's a supplier. Or, you know, if I go down to one of these stores, I could do the same thing. I could do a transfer and I could change this. So this now could be set here. If I created my transfer, clicking on this item by plan, so this is another tab within the ribbon, the transfer will be from one store to the next store. And so you could create the transfer that way. Excellent, thank you. Okay, the, the other... Um, enhancement to go through is the different SKUs by warehouse or different, I'm sorry, different default vendor by warehouse. So you see here for this product and these locations, the default vendor or supplier is 2236. For these locations, the default vendor is 2639. So if I do a requisition here, it will default to that. Now, this could be set in either warehouse defaults or you could send it in the IMWH file or you could set it in the product wizard. So I'm going to link to PLF and go to the product wizard. And there's this last tab called supplier. 
And if I click on a particular SKU and go to fill priority, you could see how you could set the different suppliers by vendor. So these are set for this 2639. This is set for 2236. You could set this and change this to one or the other. And so going back to materials planning, you could see also, and let me bring this back down. If I go here to the SKU level and go to the vendor tab, we always highlight the default vendor. So the default vendor here is 2236. That's for any of these SKUs. If I go down here to these locations, the default vendor is 2639. Okay. So you're able to see the default vendor here and you're able to do the different requisitions. And so depending on your location and how it's set up, that will default to a requisition from that default vendor. All right, I'm gonna go to location totals. So location totals will show you three different tabs by warehouse. So let me drag this down here. So now you could see the current quantity on hand for the entire horizon, okay? So if, if this was filled in here, you would see your quantity on hand for each of those weeks. You could also see receipts coming in by warehouse, by location, and then demand. You could see the demand for each of these weeks by location. So this is a nice view to be able to see across your warehouses what's my inventory information and what's my demand information. Megan, was there a question on the location totals? Yes, there was. Uh, the question is, I don't see the location tab in materials planning. Why not? Uh, it's only if you have multi-echelon or multi-warehouse. Great, thank you. All right, any question on any of the, the multi-echelon or master, cha uh, master scheduling changes? If not, I'll go on to DRS. Yep, that's nothing additional right now. Okay, thank you. Yep. All right, so in DRS, here, here I have this open PO report. And I ran this for a particular vendor. This is showing me my SKUs and products, my expected receipt date, and I have my quantity and cost. So I'll review first the pivot report. All of these reports in DRS are by rows. And a lot of customers want to see information by columns. You may want to see receipt date. Or if you're looking at a forecast or for product report, you may want to see the products. So you used to have to, and, and you still could do it, you could go into Excel and do a pivot table, but now you could do the pivot report directly within DRS. So if I click on pivot report here, I could create my pivot report. And for those used to working in Excel, this is similar to dragging these different rows and column information. So if I drag SKU here and I drag description, I could see my SKU and description. My column could be expected receipt date. And then I could do my quantity here. So now I have a pivot report and I see my SKUs, the different uh, receipt dates and the different quantities that are here. There's also a pivot chart. You could go here and see a chart that'll show you the receipt dates and the SKUs. You could also switch the axis and legend. And so you could see that differently. Let me expand this here. And then I'm gonna go back to the pivot grid. So now I'm going to describe actions. So actions let us link to other windows. So if I want to go in and I want to start reviewing this, I could right click actionable items. Let's say go to SKU materials planning. 
and that'll open up the materials planning window. And so I can now go in there and review these requisitions, see if I need them, and then click next. So that's now going to work down the list for my report and show the next SKU. And you could keep doing that and reviewing it. And you could do that for any type of report. And then once you're finished, this doesn't highlight here. And if you go back to the grid report, it's the same thing. Here you could right click, here's your actionable item, and you could select that. The default is whatever you want to default it to. If I default it to materials planning, then I just have to double click. And double click will take me into it. So that's the only thing that the report does is you could double click as a default, or you could always do that right click and link into the screens. And how we set this up, the, we set up these actions in all of these DRS reports, but for any of them, you would go into the configuration utility and from the home tab, you could link into there. And it says any changes you make will not be reflected to your reopen report. And that's true for any report. If you go in and save these actions, you would save it and then go back into your report in DRS. And it'll say here, it's a systems report. But in any of these reports, you would go into this action column and it'll bring up these different actions that you could set up. And so if this is not set up and these are unchecked, you would go in there and you would check them. And some of these do have a drop down. This one says SKU or SKU status. I mean, in this case, you would link by SKU. And again, it depends on the report itself. These options are here. So when you set it up, depending on the report that you're looking at. So if you were looking at a forecast off a product and wanted to go to product level forecasting, then you would definitely do product ID. You may not go to SKU materials planning because you don't have a SKU in that report, but that's how you set these up. And you would do your save and exit. You would have a save here. I don't because this is a systems report. And then you would go back to set up your actions. You could tell if actions are set up or not if this, these are grayed out. So if it's grayed out here and you want to set up actions, then go into the configuration utility. And I think that's it. Are there any questions? That last screen that Stuart was in can be a little hairy to interpret your first time. So please connect with us if you're not using DRS actionable reports and want to help set them up. It's a very nice feature and it really helps to be able to, you know, go into the other instead of opening up a separate uh, window each time mm -hmm. and work your way through the list. Yeah. And to summarize, yeah, I have a, I have an interesting DRS list. Now let's launch it to materials planning or PLF where I can assess it further is really right. what it's all about. Stuart, one question backing uh -huh. back up to materials planning. Yeah. Question came in asking why you had to slide the product item relationship tree over when you opened up the materials planning window. And the reason for that is no one hasn't realized what Stuart's users' preferences are for screen layout as of yet. So as the user starts using that screen and it sees that they want their relationship tree to be further to the left of the screen, it will begin to realize that and save their preferences. Um, I have noticed as I've worked with users, it takes about two or three iterations for the system to recognize what layouts they want to use. Thank you, Linda. And, and this is a sample dashboard and I'm bouncing back and forth between different windows. So sometimes that this does open up, but through normal use, it really shouldn't. It should remember as you're going through. Any uh, other questions? Thank you, Stuart. We really appreciate you guiding us through this. And we, we recognize everyone that it can be, you know, challenging to keep up with them and keep up with the screens. But again, we're trying to, we're trying to whet your appetite. We're trying to increase your curiosity. Um, and, and, you know, we want to show you things that we're excited about and that we think may be underused or that are new. You know, that's what the purpose of all these webinars will be about. Uh, what's the next screen there, Stuart? 
Um, a, as you embark on your plan, your strategy, your timing to upgrade to 1901 uh, and in the future 1907 and you know any upgrade, any, any release we have, any upgrade we have, it's really important that you look closely at the system requirements that we publish in the, in the release notes and the installation instructions and to work with your IT department to, to double check your hardware. Is it, is it meeting the requirements in place for that upgrade? Is, the, is the, the hardware spec robust enough? Is the operating system uh, current? Is the Oracle database version current? Uh, we just want to understand those things before we get excited about an upgrade and, and realize that we might have additional work to do. So that's what this slide is all about. It's just a reminder. I'm not going to re read all of this. It's just a reminder to double check your your system status with your IT department, um, and and in, engage with us if you have any questions or concerns about it. Uh, next, please, Stuart. So April seventeenth, you'll see an invite for the next webinar. Uh, any follow up questions or comments or recommendations uh, or topics of interest. Uh, please send them to any of us. Um, I, I never intend for these to go the full hour, so we bought you some time. Uh, we we want to be efficient. We want to respect your time. But uh, any feedback at all, please please send our way. And as mentioned earlier, these this recording will be delivered. Thanks again, and have a great rest of your day.